great. Well, we'll continue to worship together this morning uh, by looking at the Word of God together. Uh, We are still in our series on the way of Jesus. This is just as pertinent as ever, maybe more so this morning. And uh, we've spent the, uh, the last couple of months talking about specific practices in uh, that, that were just that were part of Jesus's regular life, regular habits, uh, and that he taught to his disciples, uh, or we've been referring to them as apprentices, right? Because if we're following Jesus, we are an apprentice of Jesus. And if we're serious about learning from Jesus and about becoming like him, then these are the habits that uh, that we'll want to build into our lives as well. So, so just to refresh our memories. Uh, So far, we've talked about the practices of uh, prayer, Sabbath, solitude, fasting, generosity, and Scripture. And I hope that we've been able to grow in these practices, but but also, um, I just want to say, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, if you're feeling like the scope is just too broad and you're not sure what you're supposed to do next or you've lost track, uh, let me just say this. These practices that we've been talking about, they are not meant to be uh, burdensome. They're not meant to be uh, practiced in perfection uh, right out the gate. You could think of this series, think of this time together as a course catalog, right? If you're registering for school, there's a course catalog. Each week is a preview of, uh, of a course that will be part of our apprenticeship to Jesus. It doesn't mean we have to be proficient in it while we're, you know, reading through this this preview. Um, We're looking at practices that we will incorporate throughout our lives, ones that we'll learn more and more about as we continue to follow Jesus. So if you're feeling overwhelmed in any particular practice, don't don't quit, but slow down. Give yourself give yourself some grace. We have a few more practices to talk about in the next few weeks before we uh, move into Advent in just a few weeks. And today we are going to look at the practice of service, service as a practice of following Jesus. Uh, We're going to be mostly in John chapter 13, if you have your Bibles or there's uh, one in the, uh, the, the seat there in front of you. Uh, Mostly John chapter 13, we'll also pop over to Luke 22 for for a little bit. Both of these passages uh, tell the story of the Last Supper, which is the the evening meal that Jesus shared with his disciples on the night before he died. And we recount the story every time that we share in communion together, right? Every time that that, uh, that we, uh, we come together at the communion table, we remember how Jesus broke the bread and blessed the wine and gave those to his disciples as uh, reminders of what he was about to do for them and for us on the cross. And all four of the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of them uh, tell this story, but the Gospel of John gives us a, kind of a different view than the other three. Uh, In John, uh, we don't actually receive what we would maybe refer to as the the institution of communion, those words of Jesus saying, uh, this bread is my body, this cup is my blood. John doesn't tell or focus on that part of the story. And this is pretty characteristic of John. Uh, John tends to show us the person of Jesus from a different perspective than the other gospel writers. It can be really helpful to think of John as, uh, as telling the story as someone who was there. Uh, maybe think of the Gospel of John as, as uh, an elder looking back on uh, a really remarkable experience that they had in their youth. Telling the story from that, that first person perspective. Yeah, I was there. I remember that day. So John, uh, sometimes the technical details in John don't always line up with those in the other uh, Gospels, but again, we're hearing the story from the perspective of somebody who experienced it. So instead of saying, on July 17th at 11.03 a.m., John might say, well, it must have been midsummer because I remember it was really hot and the air smelled like honeysuckle. And you know, you're like, oh, this, I wanna, this is a story I want to hear. Like, you were there. 
Tell me what it was like. So John's story of the Last Supper uh, focuses on, on a different part of the evening than the other Gospels do. So in John, we find Jesus the rabbi. And he is giving his apprentices a final lesson, uh, really the ultimate instruction on how to be like him. Remember, the disciples are, are wanting to become like Jesus, to learn from him. And Jesus, being, uh, being a good teacher, he did not deliver this final lesson just as a lecture. He taught by doing it. All throughout Jesus' ministry, uh, he told parables, right? You're familiar with parables of Jesus, these stories that taught uh, deeper lessons and deeper truth. And in this Last Supper with his disciples, he didn't just tell them a parable. He showed them a parable but, uh, in, a, in a profoundly meaningful act that I imagine uh, must have just left them speechless. So let me read this story from John uh, chapter 13, verses uh, 1 through 5. It says, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. This is telling us that Jesus' arrest and crucifixion were, were very near. John continues, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So, he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. It would be, it would be nearly impossible to exaggerate how profound this is. We could spend a month talking about just those last, uh, last two or three verses that I read. So let's, uh, let's start to break that down. First of all, it says Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew uh, that he had authority over everything. He knew that, as another version said, that the Father had put all things under his power. He knew that he had come from God, from the communion of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He had come from that place, and he was returning to that place, returning to God. So Jesus here is facing this very human experience of death, and he's doing so uh, with all of the authority, all of the power of God. So he got up from the table. So because of this, because Jesus knew that he held all power, Because he knew himself to be God, he got up from the table. He took off his robes, wrapped a towel around his waist, and he washed his disciples' feet. There's there's deeper meaning tucked into this. Jesus got up from the table. This means that he left his rightful place, his place of honor. He took off his robes. The word here... Um, that's used means it's it's his outer garments, as you might think of as a robe, more like a cloak or a coat, uh, not a robe like one would wear in a, just in your own home today, but uh, an outer garment that you would wear in a public setting. And these outer garments in the ancient world, they were um, oftentimes could show um, status or might indicate someone's role. So Jesus's outer garments may have conveyed his role as a rabbi, which was uh, a place of honor, a place of uh, a position of authority in this culture. But also, in Scripture, Jesus' robes signify his power as God. Right? We see this uh, earlier in Jesus' ministry in the story of uh, the woman who suffered from a bleeding disorder and how she found Jesus in a crowd, and she reached out just, dis- just discreetly. She did not want to draw attention to herself. Just tried to discreetly reach out to touch the hem of Jesus' robe. And when she did, she was healed. 
And Jesus, in this crowd of people, starts looking around and says, who touched me? Who, who touched me? And his disciples said, well, I mean, Jesus, there, there's a whole crowd. There's a lot of people touching you right now. We can't get around this. And Jesus said, no, no, someone, someone just touched me. I know that power has gone out from me because the woman had touched his robe. And so the robe uh, throughout, uh, throughout the Gospels is a symbol of Jesus' power. And by taking off his robes, Jesus is showing that he is purposefully setting aside his power. He humbled himself profoundly by laying down the authority, the position, and the honor that was his. He wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, foot washing was a, was a normal thing, a common thing in Jesus' day. This isn't something we really do uh, much in our, our society today, but in Jesus' day, everyone walked everywhere, and uh, mostly in sandals or in bare feet, and the roads were dirt, and a lot of the floors were dirt, and so feet just got really dirty. And it was an act of hospitality uh, for a host to, uh, to give a, a guest the option uh, to wash their feet when they entered into your home. And you could do that by providing water and a towel, and they could wash their own feet. Or if your household had servants, you could assign uh, a servant to wash the guest's feet. This was the lowest job of the lowest servant not something the hosts themselves did. Either you washed your own feet or we'll get the, the lowest servant to do it. Foot washing uh, honored the person with the dirty feet, but it was considered to be demeaning uh, to the person who was doing the washing. And at this Last Supper, uh, it seems like there were no provisions made for foot washing as far as we can tell. Some of the accounts in the Gospels tell us that the disciples themselves uh, made preparations for this meal. And who was going to get the foot washing stuff together? That would be admitting that, uh, that you were the lowest ranked among the disciples, that you were the least important. No one wanted to do that. And so instead, I imagine, they all sat around the dinner table with dirty feet, probably just awkwardly pretending that it was fine, it's all fine, we're all fine. Until Jesus stood up and took off his robe. But the awkwardness became pretty unbearable in that moment. Here's how Peter dealt with it. In, uh, in verse 6 of John 13, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, uh, Lord, are you, going to, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. Peter protested, no. No, you will never, ever wash my feet. And Jesus replied, well, until I wash you, you won't belong to me. Then Simon Peter exclaimed, Then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Now there is a, there's a powerful statement in here about how we're made righteous and holy through Jesus. And Peter kind of sort of picks up on that. You can hear his enthusiasm. Well, Jesus, in that case, wash all of me. But do you hear the way that he's still uh, kind of deflecting from his discomfort in having Jesus wash his feet. Like, well, there's no need to focus on just my feet, Jesus. Let's look at the bigger picture here. How about my hands? He's still not okay with the idea of Jesus washing his feet. Peter here is clinging to his idea of what greatness looks like. He's clinging to this idea that that those with power and those with honor should never stoop to the posture of a servant. That is exactly the idea that Jesus is tearing down. 
John doesn't tell us uh, what prompted Jesus to get up and to start washing his disciples' feet, but the story of the Last Supper in the Gospel of Luke uh, might be able to fill in that picture for us. In Luke 22, uh, it tells us that while the disciples were sharing this last meal with Jesus, that they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. Their last night before Jesus' crucifixion, uh, they knew he was at risk of being arrested. They'd actually been hiding for a while, kind of laying low to avoid that. And it was a holy day, and their concern was, who's the greatest? Maybe they were looking at each other's dirty feet. They're like, who should have picked up the foot washing stuff? Jesus' closest disciples, these are his apprentices who have spent years with him, learning from him, imitating him, practicing his ways. I mean, these were devout, wholehearted, and faithful followers of Jesus. And like I said, they had been um, in, kind of in hiding with him. They were in danger. They knew that uh, by continuing to follow him. These were people who prayed and fasted, who knew the scriptures, who practiced Sabbath and solitude, all of it. They're really the ones that we like to identify with when we read the Gospels, right? We, we, we like to identify ourselves with Jesus' followers, Jesus' disciples, the ones who really get it. And here they are at the dinner table, bickering about which one of them is the greatest. So uh, let's, um, let's kind of weave these two uh, gospel accounts together. Because remember, they're telling the same story, but they're telling them from different perspectives. So I think if we can put them side by side for a minute in our minds, then, uh, then we could read the story like this. I'm going to go back and forth between uh, Luke and John here. So from Luke, uh, they, Luke 22, starting in verse 24, they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. Jesus told them, In this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. That's a critiquing remark, by the way. Jesus here is calling out the, the, the irony of tyrants who call themselves benefactors. Luke continues, or Jesus continues, But among you, but among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. Who's more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves at the table? Well, the one who sits at the table, of course. But not here, Jesus says, for I am among you as one who serves. Now in John. So, he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. A few verses later, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that is what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. And then back to Luke, Jesus continues, You have stayed with me in my time of trial, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I now grant you the right to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. The table where we don't sit down to be served, but where we stand up to serve others. That's the table of Jesus that we're invited to. 
So let's recognize here that this is the night before Jesus died. And he's, he's here with his disciples, with his apprentices, and he has been teaching them for years how to live in his way. And he's preparing them to go into the world and to teach uh, new disciples, for them to lead new disciples. And this, this is the ultimate practice that he wants to make sure they know. This is the, the capstone project of their apprenticeship that Jesus wants to make sure his disciples understand that they must practice service. Service uh, is the practice of doing good on behalf of others. We serve others. Service uh, trains us in the way of Jesus really in two ways. First, service to others is the primary way that we demonstrate love. This is, um, this is part of our discipleship pathway here at Crossview. If you've heard us talk about that, uh, one of the, the four main steps, as we understand them, uh, that shape how we follow Jesus as a community uh, is the step of serving others, which we, uh, we define as, as taking loving action on behalf of others. True service is, uh, is an act of love. And love is not only, it's not only the way of Jesus, love is who Jesus is. Service trains us uh, in love. And then the second way that service trains us in the way of Jesus is that service, uh, maybe more than any of the other practices, nurtures in us humility. Humility Humility is the defining, a defining characteristic of Jesus. And so it should also define Jesus' followers. It was in perfect humility that Jesus entered our world uh, and into, uh, entered our humanity as a baby. And it was in perfect humility that Jesus died a criminal's death uh, on the cross. Humility can be a bit of an elusive characteristic. We can't really wake up one day and say, okay, today I am going to be humble. Humility grows in us only when we intentionally lay aside our own robes. When we we take off and lay aside our own power or position or privilege. And we serve others without expecting or seeking praise for it. What does that look like? What does that look like for you, for all of us? Well, just like the other practices in the way of Jesus, we can learn how to serve by, uh, by watching Jesus himself. We can learn from Jesus. Jesus uh, very intentionally served those who were considered by their society to be the least, those who were deemed to be unclean, unworthy, those who were invisible to those around them, the marginalized, the oppressed, those without the position or the resources that would allow them to thrive. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus listened to women. He fed the hungry. He elevated children. He freed the possessed. He befriended the foreigner. All of the people who were considered to be uh, unworthy in their society, unworthy of contact with a respected, educated man like Jesus. And Jesus hung out with people from all walks of life, rich and poor and uh, privileged and oppressed. Jesus hung out with everybody, right? But he paid special attention to the poor and to the marginalized, and he instructed his disciples to do the same. There are, uh, there are many ways to practice service, of course, but one of the most effective in terms of becoming like Jesus is the practice of hidden service, the practice of, of acting in love toward others uh, in ways that don't draw attention to ourselves and in ways that may go completely unnoticed completely unpraised. Richard Foster wrote, 
Nothing disciplines the inordinate desires of the flesh like service, and nothing transforms the desires of the flesh like serving in hiddenness. The flesh whines against service but screams against hidden service. It strains and pulls for honor and recognition. It will devise subtle, religiously acceptable means to call attention to the service rendered. We call that a humble brag. Uh, Foster goes on to say that as we practice this discipline of service, especially hidden service, every day, humility will grow in our lives. And with humility, he says, Uh, Though we do not sense its presence, we are aware of a fresh zest and exhilaration with living. We wonder at the new sense of confidence that marks our activities. And although the demands of life are as great as ever, we live in a new sense of unhurried peace. And that, to me, sounds like the way that Jesus lived. And that's how I want to live, too and how we're all invited to live in following the way of Jesus. So let's practice service this week. Let's practice service to one another and to, uh, to those who uh, our society may think of as the least, particularly as we are uh, moving forward in this time in our country, uh, this time of division and conflict. Let's serve one another. Let's take Jesus seriously when he said he has given us an example of what to do. So this week, and worship to you, can, can come on back up. This week, let's find a way to wash somebody's feet. Probably not literally, But if you have opportunity, if there's an appropriate opportunity for that, I mean, go for it. But think about, um, think about what's the chore at home or at work that everybody is kind of secretly hoping somebody else will do. You've already thought of it, haven't you? Because you know, you don't want to do it either. Maybe start there. Start there and don't make a big deal out of it. Just do it quietly. This week, uh, in particular, so many people are struggling. Uh, Let's find ways to serve each other with love and with humility, as Jesus did. And I want to leave you uh, today with this reminder from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians. Uh, This is from uh, Philippians chapter 2. Paul says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen.